Question, can a Christian be perfect? 2 Timothy chapter 3, verse 16 and 17 says, All Scripture is given by inspiration of God and is profitable for doctrine, for reproof, for correction, for instruction in righteousness, that the man of God may be perfect, truly furnished unto all good works. Um, the Bible does say that you can be perfect, but we need to define what that means. Okay, now I've already said I have another sermon that, about sinless perfection. There are heretical people out there that teach that uh, when you get saved, your old nature is eradicated and you never sin anymore after that. Um, that's not true. Uh, what's it talking about? That's what the purpose of the study is. So let's go the whole way back towards the beginning of the Bible, back to the book of Genesis. Genesis chapter 6. And we're going to let the Bible define what the word perfect means. You know, because it said all scripture is given by inspiration of God. You know, so let's go through all the scriptures. Genesis chapter 6, verses 5 through 9. Make sure you have a King James Bible and you're turning to these passages so that you can see that I'm telling you the truth. Okay, verse 5. And God saw that the wickedness of man was great in the earth, and that every imagination, imagination of the thoughts of his heart was only evil continually. And it repented the Lord that he had made man on the earth, and it grieved him at his heart. And the Lord said, I will destroy man whom I have created from the face of the earth, both man and beast, and the creeping thing and the fowls of the air, for it repenteth me that I have made them. But Noah found grace in the eyes of the Lord. These are the generations of Noah. Noah was a just man and perfect in his generations, and Noah walked with God. So it's interesting because Matthew chapter 24, verses 37 through 39, compares the days before the coming of the Son of Man, before the second coming, with the days of Noah. So when it, we read here in verses 5 through 7 about how that Lord, you know, the Lord has repented, he's, he's looking at man, he's saying, boy, I sure wish I wouldn't have even made man. That's what the context is there. Okay, there's a lot of wicked people out there that try to say that repentance doesn't mean a changed life after salvation or turning from sin or your attitude changing. It's just going from unbelief to belief because if repentance means a change, you know, a turning from sin, then the Bible says God repented, so it means would mean that God's a sinner or something. No, you determine the word repentance or repented by the context in which it appears. God was actually sorry that he had made man here in this passage. And he ends up destroying everybody except for Noah and his wife and their three sons and their wives. Okay, so context is very important there. But it's interesting that Jesus would say before he comes back, it's going to be like it was in the days of Noah. Well, here we are today. And there's all kinds of wickedness and evil in this world. And there are very few people that truly serve Jesus Christ. Very few. But we see... Noah was perfect in his generations. Go next to Genesis chapter 17. Genesis chapter 17, verse 1 and 2. And, Abram, and when Abram was ninety years old and nine, the Lord appeared to Abram and said unto him, I am the Almighty God. Walk before me and be thou perfect. So Noah, he's perfect in his generations. God says that about uh, Noah. But here you have God actually saying to Abram, who later becomes Abraham, he actually says to him there, be thou perfect. He gives a commandment to Abram to be perfect. So don't tell me, well, none of us are perfect and things that, you know, we all say that. We, we do that. We, you know, but is it really lining up with scripture? Let's continue. Verse two, and I will make my covenant between me and thee and will multiply thee exceedingly. So, God tells Abram to be perfect. But what does he mean by that? Does he mean that he can become sinlessly perfect and never make a mistake and everything he does is just perfect? No, it can't be true. And I'll show you why. Let's continue. Deuteronomy chapter 18. Deuteronomy chapter 18, verse 9, down through verse 14. 
When thou art come into the land which the Lord thy God giveth thee, thou shalt not learn to do after the abominations of those nations. There shall not be found among you any one that maketh his son or his daughter to pass through the fire, or that useth divination, or an observer of times, or an enchanter, or a witch, or a charmer, or a consulter with familiar spirits, or a wizard, or a necromancer. For all that do these things are an abomination unto the Lord, and because of these abominations the Lord thy God doth drive them out from before thee. Okay? God doesn't want you messing around in the occult. Any kind of stuff like that. Look at verse 13. Thou shalt be perfect with the Lord thy God. Again, it's a command. For these nations which thou shalt possess, hearken unto observers of times and unto diviners. But as for thee, the Lord thy God hath not suffered thee so to do. Suffered in your King James Bible oftentimes means that it's allowing. Is what that means. In context, again, context determines the way you define the word. So the Lord is saying, I don't allow you to mess around with that occult stuff. I want you to be perfect before me. And, you know, of course, you know, you say, well, that's Old Testament. Sure, it's Old Testament, but where in the New Testament does it say that we can go and mess around with the occult? Remember, all scripture is given by inspiration of God and is profitable for doctrine, for reproof, for correction, for instruction in righteousness, that the man of God may be perfect, truly furnished unto all good works. So you have to go back, you have to go through the scriptures, and you have to say, okay, they were sacrificing animals in the Old Testament to, to cover you know, their sins and things like that, going to the Levitical priesthood and, and you know, the animal being sacrificed, and you've got to dip the blood and, you know, and all this other. And you look in the New Testament, okay, we don't have to do that. Old Testament, they had clean and unclean animals. New Testament, we don't. See? But you have to go through the scriptures. A lot of people try to say that dispensational preachers, like myself, ignore parts of the scriptures. Oh, we don't ignore any part of the scriptures. We go through and we say, okay, is this to me? Is this, does this line up with what goes on for a Christian today? We go through all, all throughout the scriptures. See, the lazy approach is not dispensationalism. It's these people that are non-dispensational and proudly you know, pridefully non-dispensational, they'll say that. I'm proud to be a non-dispensationalist. Well, pride's a problem. That's sin. But those are the people that are lazy because they just say, well, everything's for me, and then just move on. But you can clearly see, you go through and you go, wait a second. How could this stuff here be for a Christian today? It's, it's not there. But yet this here, you know, messing around with the occult, that would be for a Christian today. I mean, the book of Acts, they took their, you know, occult books and things like that and burned them. So, yeah, it is, it is there for us today. Second Samuel, go there next. And if you're dispensational, you'll also understand another thing, and that is that uh, you have, before the law is given to Moses, the Levitical law and everything else, uh, many of those things are very much still applying to us today. But we've seen already the command to be perfect is there before the law and also under the law. And I'm going to show you it's in the New Testament. I mean, we already did see that there with uh, 2 Timothy chapter 3. But I'll show you what's going on here. 2 Samuel chapter 22. Second Samuel 22, verse 31 through 33. As for God, His way is perfect. God's way is perfect. I don't think anybody would argue that. The word of the Lord is tried. He is a buckler to all them that trust in Him. Let me just stop there for just one minute. What book has been tried more than this King James Bible? For over 400 years, this book has been tried and put on trial. And all these different ones come out. The new Revised Standard Version, the Revised Standard Version, and all the different Greek texts and everything else, they all come out and they all attempt to dethrone the King James Bible and yet they can never do it. A lot of them, they come out and within a few years, they're, they're out of print. Nobody even wants them. The word of the Lord is tried. Yeah. Only one book has passed the trial of time. That's King James Bible. Verse 32. For who is God save the Lord, and who is a rock save our God? God is my strength and power, and he maketh my way perfect. You can't make your way perfect on your own with your own power and whatever else. 
it has to be God's help and his word that's tried. Second Chronicles, go to Second Chronicles. Second Chronicles chapter 15, verse 17. But the high places were not taken away out of Israel. Nevertheless, the heart of Asa was perfect all his days. Now here we see something very interesting. The high places were not taken away out of Israel. The high places were where they, were, they would worship um, false idols and things like that in these high places. Um, still very much done today, by the way, too, I might add. Without getting no big study on that. But uh, pagan people like to go up on top of mountains and do rituals and ceremonies and things. But here's the point. He didn't do exactly everything that he should have done, and yet, nevertheless, the heart of Asa was perfect all his days. Hmm. Can you be perfect in heart and yet not perfectly sinless? Yes. That's the point of this study. I'm going to show you about that. Go next to 2 Chronicles chapter 16, beginning in verse 7. The next chapter, in other words. And at that time, Hanani the seer came to Asa king of Judah and said unto him, because thou hast relied on the king of Syria, and not relied on the Lord thy God, therefore is the host of the king of Syria escaped out of thine hand. Were not the Ethiopians and the Lubims a huge host, with very many chariots and horsemen? Yet because thou didst rely on the Lord, he delivered them into thine hand. For the eyes of the Lord run to and fro throughout the whole earth, to show himself strong in the behalf of them whose heart is perfect toward him. Important verse. Herein thou hast done foolishly, therefore from henceforth thou shalt have wars. Then Asa was wroth with the seer, and put him in a prison house, for he was in a rage with him because of this thing, and Asa oppressed some of the people the same time. And behold, the acts of Asa first and last, lo, they are written in the book of the kings of Judah and Israel. And Asa in the thirty and ninth year of his reign was diseased in his feet, until his disease was exceeding great, yet in his disease disease he sought not to the Lord, but to the physicians. Had to include that. You've got to put that in there, you know. Uh, most what the physicians, the medical establishment, most of what they're able to do is maintain the symptoms. Symptoms management, and you know, would be another way to say that. In other words, if you have high blood pressure, they can't cure the high blood pressure. They can only give you, uh, you know, pharmaceutical pills, which are based on petrochemicals, to keep your blood pressure down. But they can't cure it. You're just going to be on pills the rest of your life. You know, kind of weird. And anything else, you know, that's that's really all that they can do. Um, there are very few things that the physicians can actually heal. All right, if you are in a car accident or something and you have your arm broken, well, they might be able to do a good job at that. But any kind of other sicknesses, be it diabetes or blood pressure or Alzheimer's or, you know, high cholesterol or whatever, they're not going to be able to heal it. Interesting. But look at verse 9. For the eyes of the Lord run to and fro throughout the whole earth to show himself strong in the behalf of them whose heart is perfect toward him. You want the power of God in your life? You want the power of God to protect you? Then you better have a perfect heart before the Lord. You say, well, how is this possible? He, you know, Asa is messing up here. I don't understand. I mean, here in verse uh, chapter 15, verse 17, nevertheless, the heart was, of Asa was perfect all his days. But over here, he messes up and doesn't trust the Lord. How's that work? Is that a contradiction? No, no. And here's the whole point, okay? Let me illustrate what I'm trying to say here with a little story, just to prove my point. Let's say I want to go across the road. There's a store across the road. Uh, well, I'll say it this way. There's a field and then a road and then a store, okay? And I want to go to that store and I need something from that store. So I start walking. I tell people, hey, I'm going to go over to the store and I'm going to get that item and I'll be back. So I start walking across the field and I'm doing just fine. And all of a sudden I trip over a rock and I go right down face first into a mud puddle. Well, it doesn't matter. I got to get to the store. Yeah, but you look terrible. Well, 
oh well. And so I start walking a little bit farther and there's a, there's a little bit of fence at the end of the field there and it leads to the road and I go to climb over the fence and it, it tears my pant leg. <sighs> well, I gotta get to the store. But what are people gonna think about me? What, you know, aren't people gonna look at me funny? Well, it doesn't matter, I gotta, I gotta get to the store. You see, I go to the store, I get the item and I stumble my way back across and I say, there, I went to the store. And people say, no, you didn't. You walked over there and you fell and you tripped and you tore your pants and you, and you almost got hit by the car while you were crossing the road and you did this and that. Yeah, but I, I said I was going to go to the store and I got there. You see, my heart was, I have to get to that store. And I don't care what happens to me between now and then, I'm going to get to the store. You see? Somebody whose heart is right with God, somebody whose heart is perfect with God, let me say it that way. It doesn't mean that you go through life without ever making a mistake. It doesn't mean that I'd walk through the field there and, and cross the fence and through over the road and to the store and back without ever falling down or getting messed up or getting dirty or whatever. No, it just simply means if your heart is, I want to be perfect before God, you're going to do that. And it doesn't matter what people think about you. It doesn't matter if you fall down and get messed up and whatever else. You're going to get back up and you're going to go right back at it. See, that's the point. A Christian will not be perfect sinlessly, okay, or sinlessly perfect, I'll say it that way. You're, you're never going to get to the point where you never sin, okay? That's not possible for a Christian. But you can be perfect as far as in your heart saying, Jesus is, is everything to me. You know, it's kind of like the stony ground here. The stony ground here, they're, they're all, they're, they're a Christian and everything else, and all of a sudden things start to go bad, and they have no root in themselves, you see. And so persecution comes because of the word and they fall away. They go right back to the world again. They say, well, I tried that Christian stuff. Yeah, I tried that. I used to listen to Brother Brian Denlinger and, and he was, he had some good stuff, but I, he was a heretic and blah, blah, whatever else. And I just went back to doing what I did before. A sow that was washed to her wallowing in the mire. The dog returns to his vomit. The Bible talks about that. You see what I'm saying? Is your heart perfect with the Lord? I mean, is there anything that's going to knock you off course and make you doubt Jesus Christ? Oh, but you, Brother Brian, you don't understand what some Christians have said to me. I don't care what Christians said to you. Oh, oh Brother Brian, you've offended me in some things. I don't care if I've, if I've offended you. All right? Is your heart perfect with the Lord? You don't need me in your life to have a perfect relationship with Jesus Christ. Do you understand? I hope so. Next, let's go to 2 Chronicles chapter 25. 2 Chronicles chapter 25, verses 1 and 2. Amaziah was twenty and five years old when he began to reign, and he reigned twenty and nine years in Jerusalem, and his mother's name was Jehoadan of Jerusalem. And he did that which was right in the sight of the Lord, but not with a perfect heart. Hmm. You mean somebody can do something that in the sight of God is right, but yet their heart's not perfect with the Lord? Happens all the time. As I said, kind of like the stony ground here that Jesus talked about in the parable of the seed and the sower and thing. And things there. There are people that will do right in the sight of the Lord, but their heart's not perfect, you see. And all it takes is just a little bit of a, a knock and from a Christian or from a ministry or from a this or from a that, and they go, oh, and they, and they just throw the Bible down and they go, oh, I'm going back to the world again. Why? Their heart wasn't perfect. You see? Is your heart perfect with the Lord? Job chapter 1. I can tell you in my years of ministry, I've had people that have done this thing to me where they go, you know, oh, I, I was listening to you, but you didn't answer this question correctly, or you didn't this, or you didn't that. And I, I went back to, I remember there was a young man and things, and he was a, claimed to be an ex-sodomite, and he, you know, I didn't say something right, or I didn't do something right, and he went back to his you know, oh, I'm starting to hang out with some of my friends again. And, well, I kind of, you know, starting to have uh, sodomite relationships again and stuff like this. But it's your fault, Brian. It's not my fault. It's not my fault. Um, I could be the worst preacher on earth, and that should never turn you away from Jesus Christ. 
Okay, I'm not Jesus. Okay, I do my best to preach the Word of God. I mess up. I make mistakes. But your faith should not rest in me. It should be in this book right here. And it should be in Jesus Christ. And nothing should ever push you away from Jesus Christ. Job chapter 1, verse 1. There was a man in the land of Uz whose name was Job, and that man was perfect and upright, and one that feared God and eschewed evil. So uh, what can we gather from this? What's you know, some of the ways that you stay perfect in your heart towards God? Are you upright? Are you a holy person? Do you seek to be holy? Do you seek righteousness as being part of your life? Do you fear God? Fearing God is a very simple equation. If you fear God, you don't fear man. If you fear man, you don't fear God. It's very simple. You get around a bunch of people and they start telling dirty jokes. If you fear man, you'll laugh at the joke. If you fear God, you won't laugh at the joke. And the people will make fun of you. Call you little goody two shoes or a little, you know, a little, you know. Mm -hmm. Doesn't matter. I fear God. I don't care. You get around a bunch of people and stuff like this and they're using profanity. A Christian will look at that and just go, nope, I'm not saying that stuff. Somebody that fears man will go along with the profanity. I mean, what, what's the point of profanity, really? <laughs> you know, it's to fit into the world, to look tough. Do you fear God? How about eschewed evil? Do you eschew evil? What's that mean? You're against it. You should get that away from me. I don't want that. Do you have enough character to say, I don't want evil around me? I'm going to stand against it, even if it makes me unpopular. Can you be perfect with God? Yep. Job chapter 1, verse 8. And the Lord said unto Satan, Hast thou considered my servant Job, that there is none like him in the earth, a perfect and an upright man, one that feareth God and escheweth evil? Does God say that about you? I have to ask that question about myself. Would the Lord be able to say it about me to Satan up there? There is none like him in the earth, a perfect, man, a perfect and an upright man, one that feareth God and escheweth evil? I hope so. I strive for that. We'll be getting back to more, more about that here in just a little bit, but it's important. Job chapter 9. Go over to Job chapter 9, verse 20 through 22. If I justice, justify myself, mine own mouth shall condemn me. If I say I am perfect, it shall also prove me perverse. Though I were perfect, yet would I not know my soul. I would despise my life. This is one thing, therefore I said it, therefore I said it, he destroyeth the perfect and the wicked. All right? So Job's looking at himself and he's going, you know, I don't understand what all just happened to me here with losing my children, losing all my wealth and everything else. I don't I don't get it. You know, my wife turned against me, everything's going falling to pieces. So uh you know, though I were perfect, yet I would not know my soul, I would despise my life. You know, he's he's going, I don't understand why this stuff happened to me. If I was perfect, if I was really good, I guess it, you know, why would this have happened to me if I, you know, if I'm a perfect guy? I guess I'm doing something wrong, you know. See, so he's talking as a man would talk. He's questioning, why did God let this happen? Go to Job 38. That's exactly what people will do when they, you know, go through trials and things like that. But see, one who's perfect in their heart towards God is not going to say, well, I don't, I just, maybe God's not even real or, or I, I don't know why God would have done this. And, and, you know, and we all struggle with it. We all have those experiences like Job had. You know, we've all been through trials and, and tribulations and things like that where you just feel like, you know, what's going on here, Lord? I don't, I don't get it. But look what happens here. Job 38 Verses 1 through 4. Then the Lord answered Job out of the whirlwind and said, Who is this that darkeneth counsel by words without knowledge? Gird up now thy loins like a man, and, like a man, for I will demand of thee and answer thou me. 
Where wast thou when I laid the foundations of the earth? Declare if thou hast understanding. God has to come along in a whirlwind. I mean, think about that. This tornado is coming right towards where you're sitting, and it stops, and then God starts speaking out of it. Kind of a humbling experience, I'm sure. But the Lord starts to put Job in his place and say, Hey, you're saying a lot of foolish things here. That's what happens when you are perfect in heart. And all of a sudden, God lets some bad things happen in your life, and you start to question. You start to say, I wonder if the atheists are right. Maybe, the, maybe, maybe we did evolve, and maybe, maybe the whole thing. Maybe the, is the Bible even accurate? And I don't. Know. And you start to get all these doubts going through your mind. All this stuff. God might have to come to you and put you in your place. And if He does, then this needs to be your attitude. Job chapter forty-two, verse one. Then Job answered the Lord and said, I know that thou canst do everything, and that no thought can be withholden from thee. Who is he that hideth counsel without knowledge? Therefore I have uttered that I understood not, things too wonderful for me, which I knew not. Here I beseech thee, and I will speak. I will demand of thee, and declare thou unto me. I have heard of thee by the hearing of the ear, but now mine eye seeth thee. Wherefore I abhor myself, and repent in dust and ashes. Yeah. Sometimes you'll get through something. Um, this whole land thing I went through back in 2017, you know, that we went through it and just questioning what is going on. I mean, just with the thing of the, uh, we had to sell the property and, and, and it was like just, it sold in eight days. I'm going, this is great. It's going to have settlement. We'll be able to get a property and we can move on with our lives. And then it just kept on, they kept on putting postponing the date of things and and just uh, we went through so much stuff this past year and it was just i was getting angry and i was just going lord what's going on here i need to know what to do and, and it was frustrating and you get to the end of the thing and you see how the lord led you the whole way and he got you exactly where he wanted you to be and the whole time you're you're struggling with even trusting him and you what do you do I pour myself and repent in dust and ashes. His ways are perfect. And you can be perfect in heart, you know, and stuff. And, and, and you know, I am perfect in heart. I will say that. I'm not perfectly sinless. Uh, but I'm saying, I love the Lord. Uh, none of you are going to push me away from the Lord. I don't care what people say about me. I don't care what videos come out about me. I don't care what websites are dedicated to hating me. I'm not going to turn on the Lord. There's nothing else to turn to. You see, I've gotten rid of anything else in my life that could get between me and, and the Lord Jesus Christ. There's nothing there. Yeah, I mean, you could you could pull in here a million dollars worth of, of whatever, neat things and stuff like that and say, here, reject Jesus Christ. I'd say, get your trailer off the property. There's nothing that's going to push me away from the Lord. But there are those times when I start to fail to trust the Lord. I have those Job experiences, and all of a sudden I start to kind of say, well, I don't really understand it. And then the Lord gets me through all of it and says, for we know that all things work together for good to them that love God, to them who are all the called according to His purpose. Boom, here's the answer to your prayers. And, I, uh, and all of a sudden I realize, well, that sure was stupid, me questioning the Lord all that time. And I abhor myself and I repent. Sorry, Lord, I, I, should, have, I should never have thought those things. You'll go through that as a Christian. Go to Psalm 18. Continue here. Psalm 18, verse 30. As for God, His way is perfect. The word of the Lord is tried. See it again there. He is a buckler to all those that trust in Him. For who is God save the Lord, or who is a rock save our God? It is God that girdeth me with strength and maketh my way perfect. Yeah. Like we read about back there in Deuteronomy. Mm -hmm. Psalm 37. Psalm 37, verse 37 through 40. Mark the perfect man, and behold the upright, for the end of that man is peace. 
But the transgressors shall be destroyed together, the end of the wicked shall be cut off. But the salvation of the righteous is of the Lord, he is their strength in the time of trouble. And the Lord shall help them and deliver them, he shall deliver them from the wicked and save them, because they trust in him. Hmm. You heard the study on peace in the life of a Christian. You get peace from Jesus Christ. Yeah. But uh, how do you have that peace? By being wishy-washy in your relationship with the Lord? Saying, if somebody could prove to me such and such, I'd probably leave the Lord. I don't know. I, you know, I see people and they go, well, there's some doubts I have about the King James Bible and I, I don't know what to think and things. Okay, replace it with something else that's perfect. You can't. Is this the book? Yeah. Well, then don't let anybody mess with it. Come along and I can prove some errors in there. Well, good for you. Have a good day. <laughs> you know. I'm going to be doing some more stuff on the Bible version issue in the future too, by the way. Just to give you a little heads up out there if you're saved. Go to Psalm 101. Psalm 101, verse 1 through 8. We'll read the whole psalm here. I will sing of mercy and judgment unto thee, O Lord, will I sing. I will behave myself wisely in a perfect way. O when wilt thou come unto me? I will walk within my house with a perfect way heart. Here's an interesting thing. I just got to say this before we continue because you're going to see this throughout this psalm. One of the things that you can do in this wicked world is shield yourself from that wickedness in your house. That's why I think it's best for Christians to live, you know, in, a, in at least in a country setting, especially nowadays, uh, where you're not joining house to house. The Bible talks about, you know, not joining house to house. Um, keep that stuff away. Uh, you, you know, you'd be surprised how little you actually need to live on, um, you know, when you get that right down to it. And I know, you know, we are willing to live quite poor compared to what most Americans live like to stay away from apartment complexes and city life and whatever else. Um, we want to keep evil away from this place. We want to be able to walk before the Lord in a perfect way. How are you going to walk before him if the neighbor next door has rock music playing or some kind of television, you know, movies playing or whatever else. You can't walk before the Lord perfectly when you're hearing profanity and, and all the other wicked, vile stuff out there. I mean, I understand people get into situations, you get, you know, locked in a mortgage or you, you know, rent or whatever kind of things like that. I know, but you should strive to get away from that stuff. I mean, just do an experiment. Take a drive out into the country sometime out to some park or something like that, and just go for a walk in nature and see how you feel. It's an important thing. Let's continue. Verse 3. I will set no wicked thing before mine eyes. I hate the work of them that turn aside. It shall not cleave to me. A froward heart shall depart from me. I will not know a wicked person. Hmm. Well, I still have some people that I hang out with and I still go, go to see people and stuff like this and uh, they're kind of wicked and whatever else. Why? Well, because we're family, because we're related, because we're this, we're that. doesn't matter. If they're wicked and they have no desire for repentance or anything else and you've tried to witness to them and whatever and it just blows up, get away from them. Why? Because you're supposed to be perfect. You see. How can you stay in fellowship with God when you're, you know, it's like saying, I want to stay clean while walking through this sewage. I mean, I real, I understand we're in the world. I understand that. You have jobs to go to. You know, I got to go to the store. I got to go out around lost people and things like that. But you know what? In this place here, I'm not going to have wickedness. I'm not going to bring wickedness into my home. I'm not going to have a bunch of filthy music playing or, or filthy movies or television on or whatever else. I hate that stuff. I want it away from me. And I'm not going to let wicked people come into this home and use profanity and everything else. No, get out. Continuing, verse 5. Whoso privily slandereth his neighbor, him will I cut off. Him that hath an high look and a proud heart will not I suffer. Mine eyes shall be upon the faithful of the land, that they may dwell with me. 
He that walketh in a perfect way, he shall serve me. He that worketh deceit shall not dwell within my house. He that telleth lies shall not tarry in my sight. Zero tolerance, in other words, you could say. I will early destroy, destroy all the wicked of the land, that I may cut off all wicked doers from the city of the Lord. You know, some people apparently don't care about profanity in the comments and wicked stuff in the comments and things. I see people, well, good and bad. It's, it's good to look at both sides and stuff. I don't agree with that. Um, you're going to, you know, if you learn the Bible and you do right, you're going to hear, quote unquote, both sides because you're going to get into debates with people and stuff. And I don't mean organized debate type of stuff. I'm just saying, witnessing to people. You're going to get to hear the uh, opposition to your beliefs. But the whole thing is, for years and years and years, I've been doing this thing of the, the whole comment thing. And, you know, it's just like it's so vexing sometimes in the comments. And I see people it just, I mean, just horrible stuff that people will write. And it just makes you feel dirty. And I mean, there have been times, literally, I'll get up in the morning, come upstairs, and, I'm, and I was like, you know, oh, well, I got to check comments and things and see if there's anybody posting comments. And within a half hour, I feel so dirty and filthy from having to go through some of these comments and just the wicked stuff that people are writing and uh, posting links to stuff. And I go and it's, oh, man, got to go into their channel and, and block them. And then I got to go back to the sermon that they posted the comment on and I got to get rid of their comment. And, oh, they've posted comments on other things. And uh, what's going on? He that worketh the seat shall not dwell within my house. He that telleth lies shall not tarry in my sight. I will early destroy all the wicked of the land, that I may cut off all wicked doers from the city of the Lord. Well, I don't have some of that stuff, but the point is, I can at least do this stuff on this channel. So that you can come here, and you don't, as you're listening, you can be reading from your King James Bible, and there's not going to be anything that's defiling you. All right? If you look down at the comments section, there aren't any comments there anymore. Okay? So you're not going to look down and go, What's the, huh, what, you know? And I know a lot of people, you listen to my stuff when you're doing chores or when you're at work or whatever else, and you, you don't, I mean, you know, let me say it this way. Um, what would you think if occasionally I just let a cuss word fly? Just occasionally I said, oh, what the, you know, whatever. I mean, you can listen to me, to my preaching with anybody around, your children can be present. If I have to say something that's a little bit graphic or whatever, I'll say you might want to just cover your children's ears or whatever because I have to explain what this thing means or whatever. I'll do that. And I've gotten to that point where I'm just, you know, this all this, the people out there are so vexing and so vile. I'm just saying I, I don't want that stuff even around. I want you, the viewer, to be able to come here to a safe place where you're not going to hear the King James Bible being questioned or torn down. You're going to hear the Word of God without vexation and of comments and things like that, people putting profanity and other horrible stuff and whatever. But let's continue. Isaiah 26. Isaiah chapter 26. Verse 3, very good verse. Thou wilt keep him in perfect peace, whose mind is stayed on thee, because he trusteth in thee. Again, do you trust the Lord? How do you have a perfect heart if you don't trust the Lord? Well, I, you know, I don't really know if he can get me out of this situation. Well, I don't really know if he's going to, you know take the body of Christ away before the time of Jacob's trouble. I mean, I've seen the arguments, but I still have my doubts. Your heart's not perfect with the Lord. You could be saved. Absolutely. All right? But get some things figured out there. Get some things straightened out. Now let's go to the New Testament. The book of John, chapter 17. John 17. Beginning in verse 20. John 17, verse 20. Neither pray I for these alone, but for them also which excuse me, for them also which shall believe on me through their word, that they all may be one as thou, Father, art in me, and I in thee, 
that thou that they also may be one in us, that the world may believe that thou hast sent me. And the glory which thou gavest me I have given them, that they may be one, even as we are one. I in them, and thou in me, that they may be made perfect in one, and that the world may know that thou hast loved, sent me, and hast loved them as thou hast loved me. Okay? I got through the passage here, <laughs> stumbling around a little bit. But the whole point is there, Christian unity is supposed to show people that we're perfect in our love for the Lord Jesus Christ. And, you know, there has been so much. I mean, if you go back 100 years ago, um, Christians would have gotten along a lot better. And, of course, on back through, you know, before that. Uh, there's just so much leaven right now in the body of Christ that uh, it's very hard to be unit, you know, united and things like that. And, and, and nobody wants to take a stand and say, well, this is the way it is and the other systems are lies. Um, I've taken a lot of those stands. And because of that, I get called cult leader and I get all the other stuff. And doesn't mean anything. Whatever. You know, <laughs> you just got to get to a place where you don't care about that stuff. Romans chapter 12. <clears throat> Romans chapter 12, verses 1 and 2. I beseech you therefore, brethren, by the mercies of God, that ye present your bodies a living sacrifice, wholly acceptable unto God, which is your reasonable service. And be not conformed to this world, but be transformed by the renewing of your mind, that ye may prove what is that good and acceptable and perfect will of God. I've talked about that in other studies. We're not going to get into a whole lot of the thing of the three different wills of God there, what those three different things mean. But the point is, you can be in the perfect will of God. 1 Corinthians chapter 2. Turn there next. 1 Corinthians chapter 2, verses 1 through 7. And I, brethren, when I came to you, came not with excellency of speech or of wisdom, declaring unto you the testimony of God. <laughs> I can relate a little bit to Paul there. For I determined not to know anything among you, save Jesus Christ and Him crucified. And I was with you in weakness and in fear and in much trembling. And my speech and my preaching... <laughs> was not with enticing words of man's wisdom, but in demonstration of the Spirit and of power, that your faith should not stand in the wisdom of men, but in the power of God. Howbeit we speak wisdom among them that are perfect, yet not the wisdom of this world, nor the princes of this world that come to naught. But we speak the wisdom of God in a mystery, even the hidden wisdom which God ordained before the world unto our glory. Hmm. Again, what I've been saying, that your faith should not stand in the wisdom of men, but in the power of God. All right? I'm not going to be perfect in my speech and things, and I'm not sinlessly perfect. But the whole thing is, my heart is perfect with God. There's nothing that's going to come to the point where I'm going to say, hey, you know what? I decided to leave the Lord. I'm going to monetize my account. I'm going to start making videos on some worldly thing. And I'm just going to ah, forget Jesus. Ah, that was all just fake or something. That's not going to happen. It's not going to happen. Right? And what happens when you have Christians that go through this thing or professing Christians that they go through this and they say, well, I was a Bible believer for all these years and things like that. And then they go right back to the world that, that they supposedly came out of. You have somebody whose heart was not perfect with the Lord. That's what you have. Let's go to 2 Corinthians 2 Corinthians chapter 12. Another way to be perfect. 2 Corinthians chapter 12, verses 7 through 10. And lest I should be exalted above measure through the abundance of the revelations, there was given to me a thorn in the flesh, the messenger of Satan to buffet me, lest I should be exalted above measure. For this thing I besought the Lord thrice, that it might depart from me. And he said unto me, My grace is sufficient for thee, for my strength is made perfect in weakness. Most gladly, therefore, will I rather glory in my infirmities, that the power of Christ may rest upon me. Therefore I take pleasure in infirmities, in reproaches, in necessities, in persecutions, in distresses, for Christ's sake. For when I am weak, then am I strong. 
Kind of reminds you of the story of Job, doesn't it? Yeah. There's going to be times as a Christian that you're going to go through stuff that you're just going to say, I don't know what on earth you're doing right now, Lord. I don't get this. I don't understand this. But your heart can remain perfect in that time. You can walk across that field. Sometimes it's easier to walk to the store and back. You know what I mean? Other times it's terrible and you fall and you're discouraged and people are laughing at you and mocking you in your walk with the Lord. You just got to go through it. The Lord has reasons for everything. There are no coincidences with the Lord. And there's going to be times when you're going to be very, very weak and you're going to want to give up. But then that's when you need to think to yourself, I remember what it was like back when I was lost. I really don't want to go back to that again. And look at all the Lord's done for me. Count your many blessings, name them one by one, and it will surprise you what the Lord hath done, like the old hymn says. And all of a sudden you won't be so depressed anymore, and you'll say, you know what, Lord, I don't know what's going on right now, but I'm just going to have to trust you. It's very hard right now. That's how you stay perfect with the Lord. Go over to chapter 13, 2 Corinthians chapter 13, verse 11. Finally, brethren, farewell. Be perfect. Be of good comfort. Be of one mind. Live in peace. And the God of love and peace shall be with you. We're supposed to have unity in the body of Christ. And, you know, it's frustrating because it's like there's times I'm thinking to myself, well, if we could just, you know, get a bunch of faithful brethren together and, and really, you know, classify what we have and what we believe, and this is what Bible-believing Christianity is, and if you're not part of that, you know, belief system and things, well, then you're not a Bible believer and whatever else. And it's like, yeah, but then the devil would get somebody in there or somebody would fall away or get messed up or whatever. It's problematic, you know. It's just, it's about being perfect in your heart with the Lord. And that's where you're going to have unity. You're going to be able to say, yeah, Brother Brian, I don't agree with you on the, some of the things that you've said or whatever else, but you know what? I know you love the Lord. I know you love His Word. I know you're going to preach faithfully. Thank you. You've been an encouragement to me. And I thank people for saying stuff like that because you're an encouragement to me. You know? And I had a bunch of you write, you know, and say that you, you know, are glad that I made the decision that I did through private message, you know, and, and things, and I, I appreciate that. Thank you. You know, I like the encouragement there. It's, it's, you know, means a lot to me. Galatians chapter 3. And I had some discouraging stuff too, which is fine. Uh, Galatians chapter 3, verses 1 through 3. O foolish Galatians, who hath bewitched you that ye should not obey the truth, before whose eyes Jesus Christ hath been ed evidently set forth crucified among you? This only would I learn of you. Receive ye the Spirit by the works of the law or by the hearing of faith? Are ye so foolish? Now look at this. Having begun in the Spirit, are ye now made perfect by the flesh? You say, see, see, Brian Denley, you stinking heretic, you. You're, the, you're one of the worst preachers out there. You're trying to make people, you know, this legalistic system and everything else. You know, I you know, can't count how many times I've been called a legalist and whatever. I'm not a legalist. Okay, first of all, that term, legalism, I was going to do a study on what is legalism and whatever else. And I'm not going to do it because it's a philosophical term. And they do this, it's, it's this whole thing of, okay, the Bible says that a young woman is to marry, bear children, guide the house, give none occasion to, to the adversary to speak reproachfully, for some are already turned aside after Satan, First Timothy chapter 5. And they go, but, okay, that's what we see, that's like the law, okay? And then, what if, though, what if uh, um, there's a young woman who is lost and she's in a situation where she has to work and then she gets saved and she's still in that bad situation. See, how can we, you know, live under the law when we should have grace for her situation? It's this philosophical nonsense is what this whole legalism thing is. And the whole point is the word legalistic or legalism or whatever does not appear in the King James Bible. And they'll say, well, the book of Galatians is about legalism. Uh, no, the book of Galatians, you know, from their standpoint there, you know, that you've got to live by the standards of Scripture, and that's legalistic. 
Uh, no, what's going on in the book of Galatians is you have Jews that are going to the Gentiles and saying, hey, you're a Christian now, you're saved and everything else. Well, you're going to have to go back here to the Levitical law. That's what's going on. So the thing of, of you can't this and you can't that, like the you know all the standards in the Old Testament, if you touch this, you're unclean till the evening. And, and uh, you know Peter going and he's, he's eating with the Gentiles and stuff like this. And then all of a sudden he sees some Jews coming and he, he withdraws himself. You know, after God showed Peter that there's no difference between clean and unclean. You know, I mean, who should have known better than Peter? But that's what's going on in the book of Galatians. It has nothing to do with, you, you, you don't really have to follow the New Testament um, to the letter. Okay, if there's some things in the New Testament where Paul says you're to do this, well, you don't really have to. That's not what's going on there. All right. That's what people, these easy believers and people mostly, they'll, they'll do this thing. They'll try to, to say uh, somebody that teaches that there's a changed life after salvation. They say, well, you're being legalistic. You're, you're doing what Paul condemned in the book of Galatians. They don't have a clue. Okay. People that are like that are not saved. Guarantee it. You're not going to be made perfect by the flesh in the sense of, you know, going back under the law and trying to, you know, do all that stuff. Philippians chapter 3, verse 10. That I may know him in the power of his resurrection and the fellowship of his sufferings being made conformable, conformable unto his death. If by any means I might attain unto the resurrection of the dead, not as though I had already attained, either were already perfect, but I follow after, if that I may apprehend that for which also I am apprehended of Christ Jesus. Okay, another very important point. Uh, one of my big inspirations um, in as a wood-turning artist was a man, a British man named Bert Marsh. I'm not sure if he's still alive or, or not. He was in uh, World War II. Um, veteran of World War II, uh, so he might, be, he might be going now, I'm not sure, um, but, you know, secular, I don't know if he was saved or not, no idea, but the whole point is, he made some of the most beautiful wood turnings, just as far as the form and everything else, and real thin wall wood turnings, and I remember he said, Your, every piece you make, you should strive for a perfect piece. You'll never attain the perfect piece, but as long as that's your goal, you're always going to do your best. And I adopted that kind of as a way of, you know, when I was a wood turner, I would, I would try to follow that advice. Try to get a perfect piece. Don't just go, oh, that's good enough, or, or ah, I don't really need to sand that or more. I don't, you know, it's, it's close enough to, to the wall thickness. I don't, no, try to get it perfect. You see? Now, that's what you're supposed to do as a Christian. And it's not a grievous thing. Oh, I got to follow these laws. Uh. I don't understand how a Christian could say that. I got to get closer to Jesus. You know, I can't stand that. You know, what do you mean I can't swear and I can't I can't go out and get drunk? Why not? Why would you want to? It doesn't make any sense to me. Um, God's rules and things for a Christian in the New Testament they're not grievous. They're not bad. He's not telling you you know you can't go out and enjoy yourself. You can't smile. You can't laugh or something like that. He's He's not doing that. What he warns you about in the New Testament, those things are bad. They're negative. Get them out of your life. You'll enjoy life that much more. Okay? But a Christian is supposed to say, I have a perfect love for, for the Lord Jesus Christ. I'm not going to let anything you know, push me away from him. His word is tried. It's been proven many, many times. Um, and I want to continually strive for that perfection. You know, I want to try my very best for the Lord. I mean, there should be a struggle there between the flesh and the spirit. And you struggle not because you're sinless. You struggle because you do still sin. But let's continue. Verse 13. Brethren, I count not myself to have apprehended, but this one thing I do forgetting those things which are behind and reaching forth unto those things which are before, I press toward the mark for the prize of the high calling of God in Christ Jesus. Are you pressing there? 
toward the mark for the prize of the high calling of God in Christ Jesus? I'm going to be talking a little bit more about this in, in my upcoming vehicle testimony thing where because I was very much into motorsports. Um, but the whole point is, when you get into racing and you're racing competitively and stuff like that, I never raced professionally or anything else, but just neighborhood racing, ATVs, dirt bikes, whatever else, um, you're racing to win. Are you racing to win? Something to think something to think about verse 15 let us therefore as many as be perfect be thus minded and if in anything ye be otherwise minded god shall reveal even this unto you god will reveal things that you need to clean up of course he will verse 16 nevertheless where to we have already attained let us walk by the same rule let us mind the same thing brethren be followers together of me and mark them which walk so as ye have us for an ensample you know, good practice to do as a Christian is to think about some of the great Christians of the past. The Apostle Paul is a great role model for you, you know, as a young man. Um, think about, you know, some of the great Christians out there. Study the lives of some of the, the great men of God. It's a good thing to do. Verse 18, For many walk of whom I have told you often and now tell you even weeping that they are the enemies of the cross of Christ, whose end is destruction, whose God is their belly, whose, and whose glory is in their shame, who mind earthly things. There are professing Christians out there who fulfill these verses, verse 18 and verse 19. They glory in their shame. Verse 20, For our conversation is in heaven, from whence also we look for the Savior, the Lord Jesus Christ, who shall change our vile body, like that it may be fashioned like unto his glorious body, according to the working whereby he is able even to subdue all things unto himself. Looking forward to the catching away of the body of Christ. But let's continue. Colossians chapter 1, verse 25. Whereof I am made a minister according to the dispensation of God which is given to me for you to fulfill the word of God, even the mystery which hath been hid from ages and gen from generations, but now is made manifest to his saints, to whom God would make known what is the riches of the glory of this mystery among the Gentiles, which is Christ in you, the hope of glory. Where am I at here? Whom we preach, warning every man and teaching every man in all wisdom, that we may present every man perfect in Christ Jesus, whereunto I also labor, striving according to his working, which worketh in me mightily. I labor to be able to present every man perfect in Christ Jesus. That's why I preach against sin. I mean, what kind of preacher would I be if I didn't, if I'd never brought up sin and I didn't want to make any people uncomfortable or challenge you to clean up things in your life? But see, people don't want that. Well, uh, Brother Brian, there are certain sins that you can preach on, but other ones, no, don't preach on that. If the Scriptures condemn it, I'm going to preach it like it or not. Colossians 4, Colossians chapter 4, verse 5. Walk in wisdom toward them that are without, redeeming the time. Let your speech be always with grace, seasoned with salt, that ye may know how ye ought to answer every man. All my state shall Tychicus Declare unto you, who is a beloved brother and a faithful minister and fellow servant in the Lord, whom I have sent unto you for the same purpose, that he might know your estate and comfort your hearts, with Onesimus, a faithful and beloved brother, who is one of you. They shall make known unto you all things which are done here. Aristarchus, my fellow prisoner, saluteth you, and Marcus, sister's son to Barnabas, touching whom ye have re ye received commandments, if he come unto you, receive him. And Jesus, which is called Justice, who are of the circumcision, these only are my fellow workers unto the kingdom of God, which have been a comfort unto me. Epaphras, who is one of you, a servant of Christ, saluteth you, always laboring fervently for you in prayers, that ye may stand perfect, stand perfect, and complete in all the will of God, the perfect will of God there. For I bear him record that he hath a great zeal for you, and them that are in Laodicea, and them in Hierapolis. 
Hmm. Now, if you do this little study here, there are five men that Paul names. And in verse 11, he says, These only are my fellow workers unto the kingdom of God, which have been a comfort unto me. You mean to tell me that the greatest Christian that ever lived, the man who wrote a lot of the New Testament, most of the New Testament books, there, the greatest number of New Testament you know, books written by one man is Paul. Um, you mean to tell me that uh, he only had five people, five men, as fellow workers? Hmm. I guess a lot of modern Christians would say that he wasn't very successful. Kind of an outsider and whatever else. Or you could say that uh, he followed the advice that David gave about he's not going to put up with anybody. Any kind of wickedness or sin. Which is exactly what he says over in the book of Galatians. To whom we gave place by subjection, no, not for an hour. Is your heart perfect before God? 2 Timothy chapter 3. Read this earlier, but I'll read it again. All scripture is given in by inspiration of God and is profitable for doctrine, for reproof, for correction, for instruction in righteousness, that the man of God may be perfect, truly furnished unto all good works. We've been reading a lot of scriptures. That's what we do here. You say, well, this is all just uh, good and everything. And it's for we saw it was before the law, under the law, and now after the law with a Christian. What about in the time of Jacob's trouble? Does it continue? Can you be perfect? Hebrews chapter 13, verse 20 and 21. Now the God of peace that brought again from the dead our Lord Jesus, that great shepherd of the sheep, through the blood of the everlasting covenant, make you perfect in every good work to do his will, working in you that which is well-pleasing in his sight, through Jesus Christ, to whom be glory forever and ever. Amen. Even a Jew, they're a Hebrew, and the time of Jacob's trouble, even they can be perfect through the Lord. And you'd need to be in that time period. Because if your heart isn't perfect with the Lord, if you're not walking perfectly with the Lord, you're going to stray away. Well, I was trying to serve the Lord there for a while, but, you know, I'd, I had to eat, okay? I had to go take the mark. Whatever. No, not if your heart's perfect with the Lord. James chapter 1, verses 1 through 5. James, a servant of God and of the Lord Jesus Christ, to the twelve tribes which are scattered abroad, greeting. No question at all who he's talking to here. My brethren, count it all joy when ye fall into divers temptations, knowing this, that the trying of your faith worketh patience. But let patience have her perfect work, that ye may be perfect and entire, wanting nothing. If any of you lack wisdom, let him ask of God that giveth to all men liberally, and upbraideth not, and it shall be given him. Can a Jew be perfect in the time of Jacob's trouble? Yes. James chapter 3, verses 1 and 2. My brethren, be not many masters, knowing that we shall receive the greater condemnation. For in many things we offend all. If any man offend not in word, the same is a perfect man, and able also to bridle the whole body best way for you to clean up your life is to clean this up first. It's very important. 1 Peter chapter 5. 1 Peter chapter 5 verse 10. But the God of all grace, who hath called us unto his eternal glory by Christ Jesus, after that ye have suffered a while, make you perfect, establish, strengthen, Settle you. Hmm. God can make you perfect. First John chapter four. First John chapter four, verse fourteen. And we have seen and do testify that the Father sent the Son to be the Savior of the world. Whosoever shall confess that Jesus is the Son of God, God dwelleth in him, and he in God. And we have known and believed the love that God hath to us. God is love, and he that dwelleth in love dwelleth in God, and God in him. Herein is our love made perfect. Perfect. 
that we may have boldness, boldness in the day of judgment, because as he is, so are we in this world. There is no fear in love, but perfect love casteth out fear, because fear hath torment. He that feareth is not made perfect in love. We love him because he first loved us. If a man say, I love God, and hateth his brother, he is a liar. For he that loveth not his brother whom he hath seen, how can he love God whom he hath not seen? And this commandment have we from him, that he who loveth God love his brother also. Again, we have a very weird perception of love nowadays, and that is that love means that you don't offend somebody. Um, that's not love. Okay, that's being fake. That's being fraudulent with someone. If you truly love the brethren, you're not going to worry about offending them if you tell the truth. But you'll tell them the truth because you love them. Now, contrary to what some people might think, I do actually love the brethren. I really do. Um, people that are coming in that are false, false converts and things like that, I'm going to be very rough on them. If they know the truth and I see that they're purposefully trying to turn people away from the truth, yeah, I'm going to be rough, like Jesus was in Matthew chapter 23, and like Paul was in Romans chapter 16. All right? That's what I'm supposed to do. But finally, let's end up with one more verse here. Revelation chapter 3. Verse 1, And unto the angel of the church in Sardis write, These things saith he that hath the seven spirits of God and the seven stars. I know thy works, that thou hast a name, that thou livest and art dead. Be watchful and strengthen the things which remain that are ready to die. For I have not found thy works perfect before God. Remember therefore how thou hast received and heard and hold fast and repent, if therefore Thou shalt not watch, I will come on thee as a thief, and thou shalt not know what hour I will come upon thee. Okay? Going back to the first two passages, or two verses that we read in this study, and, um, <clears throat> you know, Second Timothy chapter 3, verse 16 through 17, and that is, all Scripture is given by inspiration of God, and is profitable for doctrine, for reproof, for correction, for instruction in righteousness, that the man of God may be perfect, truly furnished unto all good works. Now we went back to the Old Testament before the law. We went back to the Old Testament under the law. We went when Jesus was walking around on the earth in the body of Christ, in the time of Jacob's trouble. All through the different dispensations to prove one thing to be true, and that is you can be perfect in your heart. You can have nothing between you and the Lord. Nobody's going to turn me from the Lord. I don't care what happens. I don't care whatever. So we've seen that. And one of the big frustrations for me and for you out there if you're a Christian today is to realize how far things have gone, how bad things have gotten. And, you know, there's some things that are just completely out of our control. I can't control electronic smog. I can't, I can't stop that. I can't stop the GMO stuff and killing the bees and the, you know, and all this other horrible stuff, this wicked abominations. I can't stop the gay pride rallies. I can't stop the politics in this country and other countries as well. I can't stop those things. I can't stop the corruption within the professing Christian church out there. All right. I can't do those things. But what I can do is be watchful and strengthen the things which remain that are ready to die. Uh, there's a lot of things that they're trying to say, oh, the King James onlyism is over. Those who believe in the pre-trib rapture, using terms of the world, uh, there, there aren't that many of them left anymore. You know, the pre-trib rapture, pre-trib fib is, is, is dead. Nobody even believes it and stuff like this, you know. And uh, people with standards, modest apparel for, for women and, and men dressing like men and women dressing like women and, and, you know, saying rock music is evil. That stuff's all, it's all just dead. Um, well, you know what, in my home, we're going to strengthen the things which remain. Why? Well, it says here, for I have not found thy works perfect before God. I don't want the Lord to say that to me. I don't want Jesus Christ to say, I haven't found your works perfect before God. Your heart's not right. You're just looking for that one little thing that somebody would say wrong or whatever else, and you're just going to leave. Go right back to the world. I never want that to be said of me. 
Verse 3, Remember therefore how thou hast received and heard, and hold fast. Hold fast. The word of God is tried. It's been proved over and over and over and over again. 400 years of this book, going through all the trials and persecutions, missionaries taking this book to the far ends of the earth, preachers standing in the pulpit and preaching this book. Are you going to hold fast to it? Yeah, but brother, I I, I heard this, I heard this thing, and and, and they they were really questioning my faith in the King James Bible, and I don't know if I could believe the King James Bible anymore, and maybe I should just kind of, kind of what? Give you your justification to be able to go over to the world and do what the world does? Are you looking for something? That'll give you that just that right little excuse, the little loophole that you can say, you know what? I used to believe in Jesus, but I don't anymore. Or can you look out there at this world and say, you know what? This world is in a rotten, rotten mess. But you know what? As for me and my house, we will serve the Lord. Hey, the world's got rock music. Not in my house. The world has wicked things and sex perversion and everything else. Not in my home. Why? I want to be perfect before my God. I want to fear God. I want to eschew evil. I want to be upright. That's my prayer for each one of you. Yes, you can be perfect. The Bible says so. But it doesn't mean sinlessly perfect. It doesn't mean that you'll never mess up. But it means that when you mess up, it isn't going to stop you from serving Jesus Christ. To use my analogy one more time, you're going to get to the store. It doesn't matter how many times you fall down and trip and fall in the mud and you get up and dust yourself off or wipe yourself off or whatever else. It doesn't matter. Your heart is fixed. I'm looking unto Jesus, the author and finisher of my faith. I haven't already attained. You see? But I'm going to keep pressing towards that. That goal. It's out there. That's going to be it. Let's close with a word of prayer. Dear Heavenly Father, I just really do pray for strength for the body of Christ out there that, that uh, we would all stand by Your Word and hold fast to Your Word. And if there's anything that we're messed up in, Lord, that we would repent of it. But I pray that we would all strive to be perfect in our heart towards You. Your Word says that we can be with Your help. And I pray, Lord, that... Uh, the saints out there would not listen to anyone that tries to knock them off course. But they would just not even waste any time on that. And just do what they can to serve you with their lives and to clean up their homes. And if they're in a wicked area, Lord, in a wicked environment, I pray that they would get away from that, whatever it costs them. And I just uh, ask all these things in Jesus' name. Amen. And I do believe, by the way, brethren, let me just say that I think that uh, as time gets worse, I think that we should all strive to get to a place where we can live at peace. Um, you might not have to go out into the middle of nowhere or something like that, you know, whatever. But if you're in downtown, some wicked city or something like that, do what you can, okay? Um, look up some kind of way to get out of there. Uh, do what you got to do, all right? Um, there's the whole tiny house movement and things like that, and I've, I've looked at some of that stuff for years, and and people, you know, in all kinds of debt and everything else, and they, they build these little tiny houses, things and stuff like this. They save up enough money to build one, and you can pull it behind a vehicle, and then they drive out someplace, and they find somebody that they can rent part of the lot from and whatever. And You can live without electric. You can live without running water and whatever else. Um, they have sawdust toilets, you know, that they'll put in these things. You just a bucket with a toilet thing built around it, and you put sawdust on it, and then you can take it someplace and you can compost it. It's, it's amazing. Uh, it's, what we've, it's what you do. Um, we've been doing that for years and years and years now. Um, it's a, you know, you got to take care of it and things like that, sure, whatever. But uh, there's, there's ways, brethren. Um, a lot of us get locked into this mentality that you just have to have certain things in our modern world and you can't ever depart from that stuff. Uh, you, can, you can live very simply. You can live very cheaply. Um, we live in a small town here. This place here is in a very small town. Um, but, Lord willing, this year, 
everything goes according to plan, we're going to be living in, out in the mountains, out in a neat area. And, uh, you know, we're going to still continue the video ministry, of course, and uh, be able to get a lot more stuff done, you know, living out in the country. But uh, I can tell you, this place here in this little town is way better than living in the city. Um, I don't know how people that are saved can live in the city. I mean, if you've been raised there, you might not know anything differently. But uh, like I said, just, just spend some time out in the country. If I'm going to challenge you on that. If you live in the city right now, take some time this year. Okay, maybe it's too cold right now or whatever else, but take some time this year to actually get out into the country. Go out and spend a day just out in nature. Go to a park or something like that. And I don't mean the, the city park. I'm talking drive out to a state park or something like that. Go on a walking trail or whatever else. Take a bus out there if you don't have a car or whatever else. Spend some time out in nature and see the difference. Feel that difference. Again, I've, I've written back and forth with Christians for years now and, they, and they're stuck in cities and they're just, oh, Brother Brian, it's so vexing, and I can imagine. And they pray about it and they, they get their debts taken care of and whatever else, or they'll, they do whatever they can to move out into the country. And a lot of them, I don't even hear from them anymore because it's just like they go, I praise the Lord. There's so much stuff to do out here and it's so neat and everything else and thank you for your advice. Great. So, um, <clears throat> it's going to be very hard for you to walk with the Lord and, and have that perfect, sanctified heart um, when you're living in, around wickedness all the time. And I know a lot of you, like I said, a lot of you have written back and forth with me and you want to get out of the whole city thing and whatever else. I strongly recommend that. Um, yes, the rapture is coming. Yes, it could be this year. I have no idea. Um, but you know what? You know, years ago, to share a little bit here, um, years ago I was very much into the mindset of, you know, the catching away is going to be just, it's going to be soon. I mean, it's just got to be soon and everything. And, uh, you know, I just, I didn't really make any plans. I just kind of thought, well, you know, I'm just going to, we're going to get as many gospel tracts out as we can, and I'm just going to serve the Lord best of my abilities and, and everything else. And I had no thoughts about marriage, uh, about, you know, having my own place and, and, you know, having a son, I mean, that would have been, huh? And here I am in 2018, seven years later from when I was really hardcore into the whole believing the catching away is going to be soon. I thought it was going to be in 2011, you know, for the 400th anniversary of the King James Bible. And, uh, you know, would have been nice, but, you know, then I would have never met my wife. She'd have never gotten saved and and uh, never had Oliver. Um, but our son, if you don't know. But, you know, here I am, seven years later, um, living a really good life. Very blessed of the Lord and, and um, just really enjoying myself. And, uh, you know, a lot of people are, oh, you shouldn't enjoy yourself as a Christian. Well, I don't enjoy myself with worldly entertainment, worldly things. But I thank the Lord for what He does in my life. I'm going to be thankful. Give thanks in all things, you know. So, uh, don't give up on life, brethren. Um, you know, there's, there's some things that, the Lord can really bless you with. And so if you're if you're stuck in the city or some kind of thing or in a bad situation and you're just vexed by the filthy conversation of the wicked and just vexed with the situation around you, start studying how to get away from the whole city thing. Start looking maybe for opportunities out in the country someplace. Um, find a, a farm that needs a, you know somebody to go there and work, a farmhand or something like that. I mean, do what you can. Uh, get out in nature, and, and you will never regret it. I'll tell you that right now. Um, but, you know, it's it's not a problem. It's not a sin to kind of think that way and to say, you know what, yeah, I want to get away from this wicked culture and everything around me. It's it's so vexing. I want to have that walk with the Lord where I can say, I don't I don't want wicked people around. I don't I, I hate the work of them that turn, turn aside. I, it's not going to cleave to me. I don't want that stuff. I want to be perfect before the Lord my God. So, just a little challenge. Uh, so that's going to be it. Thank you very much for watching.